Right, hello and welcome to another Expert Inside interview. My name is John Golden from Sales Pop, online sales magazine and Pipeliner CRM, joining you from San Diego. And today I'm joined by Adam Hartung, who is up, up, up the coast in Napa in Northern California. How are you doing, Adam? I'm very good today. Great. Um, and uh, Adam, Adam has a, uh, a great track, rec track record on uh, using proprietary frameworks for predicting business success, the Phoenix Principle and the Status Quo Risk Management Playbook. Uh, he has made keynotes and presentations to, to companies across the world. And you were, the, for eight years, the number one leadership columnist for Forbes.com with over 50 million readers. And what we're going to talk about today is a really interesting subject. And that is why all business people need to pay more attention to trends. So, um, so first of all, let, let me ask you, Adam, is how do you pay attention to trends? Because nowadays there's so much information bombarding at you. People extrapolate things. People, like, frankly, make things up um, or, or just interpret things. So it's very hard to know what's a trend and what's just trending or well, trendy. Like, there's a cacophony of data out there. There's no doubt about that. But the reality is when you talk to business people, what you discover is that 90% of decision-making up to 100% of decision-making is usually based upon internal parameters. It's based upon uh, biases and built into the system, built into the business model that, that were set up usually during the early days of the company or perhaps during a period of transition. So even though there's all this stuff happening on the outside and all of it's kind of coming at us all the time, the reality is that very little of it makes its way into the decision making process. And that's just really terrible because it, it cr literally creates a situation where, you know, we're, we're driving the bus by looking in the rearview mirror, you know, the old phrase. Uh, the future is through the windshield. That we, we spend too much time uh, thinking about all the old data, all the things that are internal to the company, how we manage our customers, how we manage our product lines, and we don't spend nearly enough time looking outside. And, and so that's why people say, well, I don't know how to separate trends. Because I say, well, it's because you don't look. You're not really putting any energy into it. You're not putting any time into it. If you would, if you would take the time to pay attention to what's going on, it's not nearly as hard to identify trends as, you know, I guess it seems whenever you're internally focused. Yeah, I and mean, a great point uh, because I, I do think, uh, you know, we get very caught up internally like everybody does. And I think the other thing is, though, time goes by. Uh, time goes by quickly and we don't always notice the fact that I mean, even even our target customer, maybe we haven't even revisited that profile in like two years and we were thinking, oh, no, we did that last week. Right. Uh, and so we get so caught up in the business that we don't ra raise our heads up, as you say, to start looking at um, data and trends that maybe affect our business because we're so kind of caught up in it. Yeah. So one of the things I always when I talk to business leaders, I'll say, do you know the difference between your value proposition and your value delivery system? Because the reality is I bet you spend all your time thinking about the value delivery system and you can get lost and forget what your value proposition is. My classic example is encyclopedias. Their value proposition was information at your fingertips. Uh, to, when they started 100 years ago, it was revolutionary. Now today, the idea of information at your fingertips is more demanding than it ever was. You know, and we, we want it instantly off of our, off of our cell phones. Um, but why didn't the encyclopedias become Google? The reality was that as time went by, they were less interested in the value proposition, information at your fingertips, and more interested in the delivery system, which was books. And they got to where, you know, all the, the price of paper was the most expensive thing in the company. Printing was the biggest part of the company. The bookmakers were where all the people resided. Operations was all about making books. And they lost track of their value proposition. So that when new value delivery systems came along, and specifically we're talking about being able to give information across the internet or develop a whole new product like Wikipedia, you know, they were stuck. They were stuck in the old value delivery system. And they were not looking at, well, how, what is a new way that we could deliver value, new opportunities to deliver value? And I think that's where most businesses, most business people get stuck, actually, is uh, a lot of people, you know, they just cling to the old value delivery system. In fact, it's not uncommon when you talk to companies, the people at the top of the company came up by being good at delivery. They were good right. at operations. They were good at sales. They were good at doing what the business model had been for a long time. And as a result, they're almost fearful of a new value delivery system. They're fearful of a new change. And so therefore they intentionally don't think about how would I apply what I see in my everyday life to my business. 
Yeah, no, no, those are great points, and uh, I, yeah, I love the encyclopedia uh, analogy because that that was a really that's a fantastic example. Of course, um, I do have to anybody under the age of about thirty five, I probably have to go look up what an encyclopedia looked like and all of that. But we all had them at home, and yes, we went to them and we opened them, and that was the latest information you had was whatever was in that encyclopedia at that time. That was the that was the uh, most up to date information you could get. Uh, but he, so here's just let me um, go back to what you were saying, a very interesting concept about the fear factor there, because you're right. Uh, I, I worked at some uh, I ran some businesses some some years ago where we had to go through a transition, which was transitioning from in person, in in class project based training to doing more, more stuff virtually online and, and you know, more collaborative, things like that. But shifting a business model that appears to be working that's kind of got good margins and all although it's atrophying it's a very hard thing to persuade people to bite the bullet because you might have to go down for a while yeah well you know the old phrase uh, you think you can fix that right and so we're constantly uh, trying to tinker with it with the old tractor the, the analogy i use is the farmer that has the tractor then he bought the tractor 20 years ago he does maintenance on the tractor he keeps replacing parts on the tractor and uh and every year incrementally it's not that expensive to keep the tractor going again but the reality is whole new types of equipment are available to farm with and they're much more productive and they'll have greater yields uh and uh, you you need to at some point stop the incremental investment to make the shift to make the change to the new technology and that's uh, that's not easy to do for people that are very incrementally focused which operations tends to be you know think about six sigma and total quality programs they're all about little tiny improvements and the idea is if if everybody makes tiny improvements on a consistent basis the long term will take care of itself well that's actually not true the more you work at trying to incrementally improve what you have the more stuck you become right you become blind to the outside world and very fixated on on fixing the, the business that you have. So it's really a, you know, a need to change the framework of planning and change the framework of figuring out where your business needs to go by looking externally and, and talking less about what you do for your customers and talking more about what your customers need and, and how new technologies can help them to get more things done. Yeah, no, that, that's another great point. I mean, it sounds kind of like my DIY projects at home, like incrementally try and do them until they're so botched up that it's much better to go out and get somebody professional to come in and put in the latest, <laughs> latest, greatest <laughs> after wasting money. But it's a great it's a, it's, a, it's a great point. It's a great point that you make because incrementalism is uh, is something that uh, you know, a lot of people ascribe to and a lot of people would see as that's the sensible way forward. But given the nature of disruption you said encyclopedias i know you go kodak is obviously another example that, yeah. of that um that incrementalism can actually end up with you being completely obsolete if you're not careful you know, look at toys r us look at sears you know made obsolete by the by e-commerce and the fact that they didn't uh, make their way in uh, to that new future um clinton christensen a professor out of harvard wrote the innovators dilemma and it got into these ideas of how you're running a business and the innovator comes along and how does the big guy try to address it and one of the things he used to say was that in her infinite wisdom, the divine creator gave us unlimited amounts of data about the past and not one absolute fact about the future. So it's easy to crawl into that fact set and study the fact set of what was already there and say, well, I'm comfortable describing what's happened in the past. I'm comfortable describing what got me here. And then we say, well, but what about the future? What are the scenarios you're developing for the future? And they'll say, well, I have no facts about the future. So therefore, it's you know, all just a guessing game. And that's just not true. It isn't a guessing game. That's where trends come in. If you if you pay attention to trends, you can see where customers are moving, technologies are headed, regulations, the direction they're going to go, uh, government policy, customer behavior, vendor behavior. Uh, this is all things that can be tracked. And then you can start to say, wow, there's a there's a shift happening. Um, I mean, take a look right now um, when the Beyond Meat was coming to marketplace. A lot of people kind of just snubbed their heads and said, wait a minute, that, I don't buy this. You know, plant based beef. That's a That's got to be a joke. But it took off. And, there, and it was easy for those of us in the trend world to say it was going to take off because vegetarianism had been growing, veganism had been growing, uh, GMO concerns have been growing about the use of antibiotics and meats and uh, other uh, problems like that. And then the farming practices 
were under attack for you know being un, inhumane to animals, uh, being uh, creating uh, detritus problems that the, the communities couldn't get rid of. All of those trends were all there. So that when you had an alternative, you said, "Wow, there's going to be a lot of people jump on that alternative and jump onto it quickly." That wasn't hard. It wasn't hard to make that forecast, right? Because the trends were all pointing to say people were looking for that alternative. They were looking to go that direction once once it was available to them. And, and that's what we don't, so you take the typical company that's out there in food processing, they would be surprised by the success of Beyond Meat, but they were only surprised because they weren't looking for it. They were, they were looking at how do I continue to do what I've done before? How do I make cheaper swine, cheaper poultry, cheaper bovine, you know, and they weren't really saying, what is it the customer wants? What are they looking for? And how would I make them happy? And what are alternatives that they could use? Yeah, no, that, that's another great, another great example, because you're correct. I mean, we we overload ourselves with lagging indicators. I mean, we love all this. You know, we can go on and have our dashboards and go, ooh, look at all those trend lines and all of that. But you're correct. Very few people know how to look at leading indicators or trends, as you say. And you have to lift your head up and, and look outwards to do it. But even even within your own, I mean, as you know, within your own customer base, there are leading indicators all the time of change of behavior, change of what they want, different things. But we're not, but most companies were not set up to capture those. Yeah, well, when, when I was first writing for Forbes over a decade ago, I was a very early um, forecaster saying that Tesla was going to be successful in the auto industry. Remember, Tesla does more than just autos, but that part of the business yeah. I predicted would be successful. At the time, they had a two-seater roadster. And uh, I said, you know, this is going to evolve into bigger cars. They're going to be faster cars, and they're going to be very successful, and they will take on transitioning the industry. And I was lambasted by the leadership out of Detroit. And they wrote letters to my columns. They wrote letters to the editors at Forbes. They threatened not to pull their advertising, all because they said that it, it, why no company from left fields ever come into the auto industry and been able to make a tremendous difference, right? And that the, that uh, Elon Musk would be, be given his comeuppance because we don't run into the regulators, he'll run into the safety protocols and never get over them. But there was a fact that I kept pointing out to them. And it was, I said, even though you say a two-wheel, a two-seater roadster is not a very desirable car, you do realize that he sells 100% of everything he makes. Even though the total range on the vehicle initially was 70 miles and then it was 120 miles, I said, you do realize he sells 100% of everything he makes. There is a back order for everything he makes. And of course, then when the Model S came out, you know, he announces the product and he gets deposits two years before the product ever hits the door. And I said the same thing. He's got orders. To, for more than 100% of what he can make. These, this is where it's easy. Like I say, it's easy to look at these indicators. The industry was saying, wait a minute, you know, gas powered cars and combustion engine cars are what we've always had. This is what people never get over road range uh, anxiety and, you know, the, the problems that they'll have with electrics. And I kept saying, they're already over them because they're already buying them and they're buying all of them that they can. And yet you're not even considering trying to make one yet. So now we see it flip. Now we're seeing, you know, ads for Volvo and the companies in Detroit, Ford and General Motors making electric cars. But it took them a decade, a decade to get there. And of course, they let in the meantime, Tesla get out to a huge, enormous lead. So it's a, when we say, you know, is it how it's hard to look at leading indicators? I always tell people it's really not hard to look at them. It's just hard to admit what they are. Because you wow. because often that leading indicator is threatening to your business model, and you would rather ignore it then identify it as a threat yeah no i think that's a great point because i do think when when you do gather start to look at and gather the information as we said it can be it can be a little disconcerting and sometimes you know we like to make like an ostrich and just uh, go <laughs> wouldn't see that stick our head in the sand and 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 keep going because um you know let's face it within an organization for you to suggest that perhaps there is a there, there is a shelf life to the to the way you're doing business right now, or that it's it's uh, you know consumer trends or customer trends are changing. That's kind of not what people generally want to hear, right? Because <laughs> again, to your point, especially if you say, well, the change is going to be this radical that we're going to have to change a lot of things and a lot of things fast. That's like a message nobody wants to hear. 
Yeah, but we can see the great success that people have that do this. So under the decade that Balmer led Microsoft, you know, he was adamant about growing Windows, growing Office, and he made acquisitions like Skype and Ericsson mobile phones. And, you know, Skype should have been Zoom, right? Ericsson should have been the Apple of phones. And all these things that could have happened, but the focus of the company under Balmer was always Windows and Office, Windows, Office, Windows, Office. And then stock went nowhere, the company went nowhere. Then And gaming, by the way, never really went anywhere either. So then they get a new CEO who comes in and he says, I want to change this resource allocation. And we're not going to focus on Windows and Office. We're going to recognize that the PC is a dying product. It's all going to go to the cloud. Pours his money into Azure. He starts making some significant bets in the gaming business. And what do we see? A resurrected Microsoft now that's real, real industry leader, right? But, it, but that leadership change led to a change in resource allocation, led to a change in market focus. And it's, and it's made them much more successful today. So it's not like it's impossible to do. It's just that you have to have the will to do it. Uh, you have to be willing to be disruptive. You don't have to act a little bit more like Richard Branson, who's willing to, you know, uh, work at funding uh, uh, Virgin Galactic for 18 years before it gets right. plane into space, right? Uh, but people, uh, you know, he made himself into a billionaire nine times over by having all these businesses that he started up in, in the Virgin Empire. And that was just willing to take advantage of the holes in the marketplace and build on trends. Uh, and uh, I think it's possible. And we see people do it like Branson or like Steve Jobs when he turned Apple around from being a Macintosh company into being a mobile company. We can see it with Nadella and what he did at Microsoft. Uh, Reed Hastings, he built, you know, um, Netflix and this company that destroyed Blockbuster. But then once it got to a certain size, he didn't take the bait and go into e-commerce. Instead, he switched from being a logistics company to being a tech company by going after streaming. And then after he's wildly successful in streaming, he realizes he got a switch and he switches the internals of the company from a technology streaming company to a content production company, right? And it becomes leader in content production. And now in the last few months, we've seen him go through another switch in the inside of the company, going towards gaming and putting more emphasis on the gaming in the company. So these things, we can see examples of them and we see that it works if you're willing to do it. Yeah, but like you said, I mean, it takes it it takes it, it takes the, the the guts to do it, obviously, and and to to make these kind of to make these kind of changes. And um, so, what do you see? I mean, when you work with people, how do you help them uh, get out of their own heads and and look forward? And then how? And once they start to see these trends, how do you help them? sort of internalize it and then go back and say, okay, this is what we need to do. And now I just need to get everybody rallied around it. Cause you mentioned, well, you mentioned that's an awful dirty word there. You mentioned resource allocation, because let's face it, people love it when you say, I'm sorry, your resources are going over here now because this is our new strategic <laughs> imperative. <laughs> Right. Well, what I always try to do is start off with that. Let's think about what the world's going to look like in the future. So back in the year uh, 20, uh, 2000, I was talking to people about, how, you know, everybody would have a mobile phone, right? And then as we got to 210, everybody's going to be connected. And, and you start saying, okay, that's when these things are, that's what we see and we can agree is going to happen. Today, I would tell people, do you figure that the future of automobiles, are they going to become autonomous? And most people will nod their head up and down and say, yeah, I do believe there'll come a time when cars will be autonomously driven rather than human driven. And there'll be a lot of benefits to that. And I say, okay, so you and I can agree that the future is going to be very different. Now, the only question is when. And so once you can get over the hurdle that it's different, and we talk about timing, the reality is, is that we all like to think the timing is going to be a lot further down the road than it probably will be. So then it's a matter of pulling it forward and saying, well, why wouldn't it you know, why wouldn't it happen in 15? Why wouldn't it happen in 10 years? Why wouldn't it happen in five? What keeps it from happening in two? And then we can see that the, why these things often seem to happen quicker than we expect is because we're just really not sitting there asking ourselves the question, is it likely to happen? And if so, when? And then focusing on what's the obstacle so we, re, and we can recognize those obstacles will fall and it will happen quickly. Yeah, and, and obviously, I mean, the pace of change is accelerated. I mean, uh, for those of us old enough to have been in the pre-internet uh, era. Uh, I mean, let's face it. I mean, business. Yeah, there's, there was certainly innovation and business change or whatever, but it was not at this at the light speed that it is now. And you know, businesses weren't getting overturned like overnight the way kind of they are now or business models. So I think, and it, regardless of what business you're in, you have to you have to be looking forward. Yes, and if, when I got out of business school in the early '80s, it, if you wanted to raise ten million dollars, that was an arduous task. It was not easy to get $10 million of debt or equity. 
And so an entrepreneur with a good idea would have a difficult time getting funded or somebody inside a corporation that wanted to go for a new idea would be in a real uphill battle to get resources shifted for it to get funded. And, and that's one of the most significant changes of the last 40 years is now we have so many more sources of capital. You know, the birth of venture capital and private equity and then the family home offices. Then we had crowdfunding platforms. Now it's possible to go out and fund up business ideas much easier than it used to be. And that's opened the door for if a corporation doesn't want to go after a market, an entrepreneur can go after that market. And I talk to people in a company and I'll say, OK, if you're in a small business or a medium sized business, you'll have people dedicated to customers. You have people dedicated to um, product development. But do you have somebody dedicated to fundraising? And I'll say, well, I don't, I'm not doing fundraising now. And I'll say, well, when you need it, it's not the time to learn. You need somebody out there that's learning. How does venture capital, home offices, making connections, talking to private equity folks, talking to the investment bankers on Wall, on Wall Street and on the West mm -hmm. Coast, saying, how can you raise money? So that you could have an ongoing plan ready to raise money to do these ideas. So that when you need to do resource allocation, if you don't want to rob Peter to pay Paul, then you can go get the money to pay Paul from somebody else. And that's not a bad thing, but it's still a lot of businesses haven't caught up with that. They haven't caught up with the need to be ready, prepared to go get that external capital. Yeah, no, you're 100% you're correct. I think people think they, they see all these people getting money and they think, well, when the time comes, you know, that can't be that difficult to process. And <laughs> as you as you well know, and we've been through it ourselves, as you well know, it's uh, <laughs> you're right. When you it's need a the full money, they job. will not give it to you. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> yeah, exactly. You, when you don't need it. So that's yeah, the yeah. preparation. <laughs> yeah, it's like, as I always say, you know, uh, to, to any of uh, any pe single people I know, is like when you're looking for a partner, you won't find one. But when you stop looking, they'll turn up. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. It's a bit it's a bit like that when you're not looking for the money, they're inundating you with emails and everything saying, hey, you want to talk about funding? And then when you want funding, it's like, oh, wow, but there's a big process behind this. Uh, so, um, Adam, this has been fantastic. Um, all of Adam's information is going to be below this video. But before we go, please do tell people a little bit more about what you do. Well, my name is Adam Hartung. I have a company called Spark Partners. And what we do is help people look forward, not look backward. So uh, do trend casting, future casting. We help CEOs and, and uh, executives and marketing people develop those future scenarios, figure out what's likely to happen, look at how it's gonna affect their current business, and then think about how they should change their resource allocation process. And that's what we do. Uh, we do everything from product valuation to company valuations to fundraising, anything to help somebody look through the windshield and quit looking so much in the rearview mirror. Perfect, listen, fantastic. I would encourage people to check it out. Uh, yeah, listen, we all need to pay more attention. We all need to face forward a lot more. So I'd encourage you to go check out Adam and his company. All right, my name is John Golden. Thank you, Adam. Thank you for watching and listening. And I'll see you all again real soon. Thank you. Thank you so much.